Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome for our fourth webinar of the Turkish uh, Tribunal. Uh, the Turkey, the Turkey Tribunal will be organized uh, soon now in May. And we have uh, several subjects that we you know, judge about, we judged about, and one of them is the freedom of the press. Uh, today, that's the subject of our uh, webinar, freedom of the press. And uh, we have several distinguished speakers who will help us and who will give insight in this very important topic. Uh, human rights are essentially and uh, it is impossible not to link them to democracy and who says democracy, who says freedom of the press without counter powers, counter balances in a free and critical press, the democ democracy can never uh, survive and without the democracy, Human rights cannot survive need. So that gives well the importance of our webinar today. And the first one who will speak is uh, Philippe Leroux. Philippe Leroux is a journalist, uh, active, uh, and he was the president of the International Association of uh, Journalists. So he's well placed to talk about the freedom of the press. He published a report on the freedom of the press. For the people who want to read the report, it is on our website. The website is turkeytribunal.com, very simple, turkeytribunal.com, and you can find the report there. But Philippe, now for 10, 12 minutes, will give us uh, an insight in the findings of his report. Philippe, you have the floor. Thank you so much, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Seth Philippe Lerut, and I am a veteran Belgian journalist, almost retired after 40 years year long career. And uh, through those years, I had a double life. I mean by this, I dedicated myself to the defense of rights of journalists on national, then on European, and then on world level. And when I speak of journalist rights, I, I mean by this social rights, but evidently the defense of higher objectives and press freedom is one, is the most important of them. And in this context, I have been confronted for almost two decades with the question, with the problem of press freedom in Turkey. And this is why I was asked to draft this report and to answer two questions. Can Turkey be considered as a country with a sufficient degree of press freedom? And can the decisions taken after the attempted coup of 15 July 2016 be considered a normal reaction for a country under attack? The answer to the first question, question should be easy, as Turkey has accepted several international declarations and agreements such as the International Human Rights Declaration, which acknowledges freedom of expression as a fundamental human right, and the European Convention of Human Rights, which regulates freedom of expression at Article 10 and Article 19. The, the European Court of Human Rights task is to verify whether the European Convention of Human Rights is respected or not, in national cases. And along the years, its jurisprudence rarely accepts national decisions that limit freedom of press and expression. Many court cases relating to freedom of expression in Turkey and involving Turkish journalists and or media have been dealt with by the European Court of Human Rights to the years. And since the year 2000, 2000 Turkey was condemned in 93 0.90% of the cases. When we speak of press freedom in Turkey, we refer to a long story of infringement of press freedom, notably by the times of the military dictatorship of the 1980 coup. But as democracy was restored, press freedom gained momentum and hope grew up that eventually the level of press freedom in Turkey should would be equal to the level of press freedom in all democratic states. When President Recep Tayyip Erdogan came to power first as prime minister, the hope remained 
even though Kurdish and Armenian journalists remained under pressure or worse. I refer by this to the murder on 19 January 2007 of Heran Ding, the famous Armenian journalist who published a bilingual uh, weekly in Istanbul. And as the years went by, the hope vanished. The repression of Armenian and Kurdish journalists was progressively extended to leftist journalists, nationalist or so-called Kemalist journalists, and investigative journalists, especially in the Ergonokon case. As you know, Ergonokon was the name of an alleged criminal network preparing to overthrow the government. And between June 2007 and November 2009, some 300 people, including journalists, were arrested and 194 prosecuted in this context. I remember the detention of two famous investigative journalists, Nedim Sener and Ahmed Sik, in 2011, which shocked the Turkish public opinion, but who were meant to also to make all Turkish journalists aware of the fact that nobody was safe for being arrested. A report of the European Commission addressed to the European Parliament and Council on 10 October 20, uh, 2012 noted, I quote, the increasing incidence on violations of freedom of expression raise serious concerns and freedom of the media continues to be further restricted in practice. From 6 to 14 April 2016, the Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe conducted a visit to Turkey. His report was published on 15 February 2017. He noticed that, I quote, that already high level of intolerance to, towards legitimate criticism of elected officials and their policies had, has further increased. And he added that Unfortunately, the deterioration of media freedom and freedom of expression in Turkey, which as just described, had already reached serious alarming levels, has intensified even further under the state of emergency declared by the Turkish government following the failed coup attempt on 15 July 2016. And indeed, Indeed, between his visit and the publication of his report, the attempt coup had occurred and launched a huge repression against lawyers, academics, trade unionists, civil servants, and also journalists in Turkey. As a consequence, by the end of 2016, 178 media out outlets were closed by, the exec by executive decrees. A further 30 publishers were closed down and their books banned. Almost 3,000 journalists were sacked without any social rights, and up to 261 of them were jailed, according to the special rapporteur on the promotion of the right to freedom of opinion and expression, who, could, who conducted an official visit to Turkey from 14 to 18 November 2016, at the invitation of the Turkish government. In his report, he underlined that news coverage that is perceived as negative to the state may be subject to punishment by authorities. Almost three years later, a joint international press mission of several journalists and media organizations paid a visit to Turkey from 11 to 13 September 2019. Its report recalled that anti-terrorism legislation is for the most part poorly defined, leaving room for prosecutors to conflate criticism of government with terrorist propaganda. In its annual report 2020, the platform to strengthen the protection of journalism and the safety of journalists created by the Council of Europe in 2015 confirmed that I quote, journalists in Turkey continue to suffer violations of the rule of law and their right to a fair trial. The Joint International Press Freedom Mission had also noticed the need for online broadcasters to pass through a security check by the National Intelligence Organization and the police, 
and that excessive, excessive license fees posed, I quote, a severe threat to media pluralism. The new, the new bill approved by the Turkish parliament on 29 July 2020 compels media companies with over 1 million users a day that to have representatives based in Turkey or who are Turkish nationals and tech companies to store their data locally. To conclude, to conclude, I want to answer the two questions raised. Can Turkey be considered as a country with sufficient degree of press freedom? If we take into consideration that Turkey has been condemned for violation of the European uh, Convention of Human Rights 154 times since 2000, that the number of journalists can be pre-trial or convicted for long-term imprisonment makes Turkey one of the undisputed leading jailers of journalists worldwide, we can conclude that the level of, of press freedom is certainly not sufficient to qualify Turkey as a democracy. The second question, can we consider that the reaction to the attempt coup of 15 July 2016 can be considered as a normal reaction for a democracy under attack? The timing, the timing of targeting a long list of journalists and media outlets only a few days after the failed coup shows that these journalists and media had been on Turkish government list well before the failed coup, and that the closure and expropriation of media outlets can besides only be seen as a strategy of the part of the Turkish government to destroy critical voices and further cripple freedom of the press and expression. On this question also, also, it can be concluded that the violation of press freedom committed by the Turkish government can no longer be considered as a reaction linked to the attempt coup or aiming at fighting political violence and terrorism. And my ultimate conclusion would be a tribute to the Turkish journalists who despite this dangerous context remain eager to defend their press freedom and, and do their jobs uh, over in a very professional way. I thank you for your attention. Thank you uh, very much, Philip. Sorry, I was a bit in problem with my uh, micro. Uh, thank you, it's a very clear answer to the two questions. And I think indeed also your final conclusion to pay tribute to the journalists who in a very difficult uh, situation are uh, still doing their job is very welcome and needed. Um, the second uh, speaker now is, uh, a bit different, he's a professor, he is, uh, he will, uh, you see that in the library that's behind him, a professor has to have a good library and we see that our second speaker has a nice library, he's Professor uh, Oran Bashkin, he is a human rights activist also and if I am right he was also writing for some time in uh, the newspaper Agos, uh, which already has been mentioned uh, with Armenian Turkish uh, uh, public, public, uh, publication. So Professor uh, Baskin will explain us and give some more insight in the global context also. Uh, Oram, can you take the floor please? Thank you for participating anyhow. Bir takım istatistikler vererek başlamak istiyorum. Ondan sonra, bu sayıları verdikten sonra e, özel durumlara geçeceğim. Önce milletvekili avukat Sezgin Tanrıkoğlu'nun raporu. 18 yılda yani mevcut iktidarın süresi boyunca 808 gazeteci tutuklandı ve halen 87'si cezaevinde. En çok gazetecinin tutuklandığı yıl 2017 oldu. Ve bu yılda 206 gazeteci cezaevine girdi. Bunların yanı sıra 27.493 kişiye işkence yapıldı. İkinci vereceğim istatistikler Strasbourg Mahkemesi'ne. Yani Avrupa İnsan Hakları Mahkemesi raporuna ilişkin. Son 60 yıl içinde Türkiye 3309 vakayla 
en fazla hak ihlal edilen ülke. Türkiye'nin arkasından Rusya, İtalya, Ukrayna ve Romanya geliyor. Bu hak ihlallerinin dökümü istenirse şöyle. Adil yargılanma hakkı ihlali 287 tane. Özgürlük ve güvenlik hakkı ihlali 208 tane. İşkence yasağı ihlali 194 tane. Mülkiyetin korunması ihlali 122 tane. Yaşam hakkı ve etkili başvuru hakkı 85 tane. Türkiye'de insan hakları ile çok yakından ilgili olan Profesör Yaman Akdeniz'in verdiği sayılarla bitirmek istiyorum bu istatistik kısmını. Ekim, Ekim 2020'ye kadar 140 bin URL, 42 bin tweet ve 11 bin YouTube videosu engellendi. Şimdi sayıları bırakıyorum. Artık konulara geçiyorum. Türkiye'de İktidarın hoşuna gitmeyecek yas- e, haberlere ve tweetlere ve e, benzer mesajlara hemen erişim yasağı getiriyor. Fakat işin asıl ilginç tarafı erişim yasağına da erişim yasağı getiriliyor. Yani siz bir haber yazıyorsunuz, erişim yasağı getiriliyor ama o erişim yasağını yayınlayamıyorsunuz. İnsanların ondan haberi olmuyor. Biz aynı şeye Menderes döneminde e, tanık olmuştuk. Ben o zamanlar 14-15 yaşındaydım. Erişim yasağına, erişim yasağı getirilmesinden daha beter bir şey var. Şimdi diyeceksiniz ki daha beter ne olur? Bizde eksik olmaz. Sokaktan adam kaçırılıyor. İşkence edilip sonra bırakılıyor. O adamın akıbetini sormak yasak. Geçen gün böyle kaçırılan bir kişinin akıbetini soran 12 kişi gözaltına alındı. Belki bundan daha önemlisi, belki değil daha önemlisi. Türkiye'de sadece ifade özgürlüğü değil, düşünce özgürlüğü de yok. Ben eskiden, uç uzun yıllar önce düşünce özgürlüğü terimini tuhaf bulurdum. Çünkü düşünce ifade edilmediği zaman insanın kafasındadır. Benim kafamı nereden açıp da içine bakacaklar da düşünce özgürlüğümü engelleyecekler derdim. Çok yanılıyormuşum. Ee, sadece bir tane örnek vereceğim ama örnek çok. Ömer Faruk Gergerlioğlu, bir tıp doktoru, milletvekili. Bir konferansa gidiyor. Ondan sonra konferansı dinledikten sonra çıkıp gidiyor. Mahkemeye verildi. Niçin konuşanın sözlerine itiraz etmedin soru sormadın? İnanılır gibi değil. Sadece ifade değil, düşünce özgürlüğü de yok. Bu arada bazı kelimelerin kullanılması yasak. Kimin tarafından kullanılması yasak? Ee, tabii ki iktidar mensupları değil, muhalefet mensupları tarafından kullanılması. Mesela diktatör demek suç. Daha da ötesi militan kelimesini kullanmak da suç. Ama AKP Genel Başkanı ve Cumhurbaşkanı Recep Tayyip Erdoğan ve İçişleri Bakanı Süleyman Soylu bu kelimeleri rahatlıkla kullanabiliyor. Mesela Cumhurbaşkanı e, ana muhalefet partisi başkanı Kılıçdaroğlu'na diktatör dedi. Türkiye'de muhalefet yaptın mı? Üç şeyden bir tanesi veya hepsi. Ya teröristsin, ya bölücüsün, yahut da LGBTİ'sin. Bazen hepsi bir. Bir başka e, inanılmaz konu, konu 
iktidar üniversitelerdeki sınav sorularına da karışmış. Marmara Üniversitesi'nde e, sorulan sorulara, sınavda sorulan sorulara soruşturma başlatıldı. Bir başka konu, gazeteciler son zamanlarda sokak röportajları yapıyorlar ve sokaktan geçenlere mikrofon uzatıyorlar. Şimdi bu sokak röportajlarına polis müdahale etmeye başladı. E, suçlama şu, şahsı Provoke ediyorsun. Sanki röportaj yapmıyor gibisin. Provokasyon yapıyorsun diyorlar. Şimdi biliyorsunuz Boğaziçi Üniversitesi'ne saldırılar var. İktidar tarafından her türlü saldırıcı, saldırı. Boğaziçi Üniversitesi protestolarına ilişkin WhatsApp grubu kurmak suçundan 23 yaşındaki bir genç kız tutuklandı. Önce gözaltına alındı, şimdi tutuklandı. Tabii ki böyle bir ortamda espri yapmak da suç. Ee, bir takım gençler istifa etmiş olan İktisat Bakanı Albayrak'ın esprili bir afişini wanted diye yazan, çünkü adam kayboldu ortada. İstifa ettikten sonra hiç gören veya duyan yok kendisini. Wanted diye bir afiş yapmaktan dolayı gençlere gözaltı uygulandı. Ve bu gözaltılar da biliyor musunuz? Tutuklanmaktan beter. Çünkü dört gün tutulabiliyor hakim karşısına çıkılmadan. Ve de gelip sizi sabah dört ile beş arası alıyorlar evde. Uykunuzdan uyandırın. Sanırım bu kadar yeter. Thank you very much. That was a very clear, let's say, testimony about daily life. And we can talk about big principles and about great ideas and uh, a lot of discussions. But what uh, Professor uh, Baskin gave us was uh, from the real every daily, uh, daily situation. And I was uh, quite, uh, how to say, on the impression that What, what he said was indeed, it's not only about the freedom of expressions, freedom of speech, but even the freedom of thought, which of course, when we go that way, is still a lot of, uh, a lot worse, because when people and the governments or authorities start to talk about what you think, uh, I think that it's really uh, a really step extra uh, more in uh, violation of human rights and human dignity and human human independence. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Baskin. Uh, anyhow, um, the next speaker is uh, has been working in different uh, media outlets uh, in different uh, situations. Uh, I think he was working also for Huffington Post and uh, Humoriet, uh, but for the moment, Uh, Mr. Yavuz Baydar is editor-in-chief of the, the media outlet uh, Aval. And uh, I take the occasion also, uh, because when we talk about freedom of the press, we often talk about the, the published press, the classic press. It is uh, very typical in a situation where a country is uh, Uh, not anymore in a democratic tradition that the online media, the media that work through internet become more and more important. And as has been explained already, uh, the Turkish government for the moment all to want to grab on that. But we, with, uh, with Yavuz, we have a clear example with uh, a media outlet. I think he's working from Paris, from abroad but where we still can reach people uh, with opinions. And uh, Yavuz uh, will explain the more the global situation. It's not about him, it is about the global situation and where we stand with freedom of the press in Turkey. Yavuz, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Lenot. Um, uh, two additional things about myself. Uh, I served as media ombudsman or mediateur uh, in Turkish Uh, domain uh, for about 15 years. So that gave me possibilities to monitor the situation uh, from the point of view of freedom, and not only freedom, but also independence uh, in terms of censorship, self-censorship, uh, and all those related issues in 15 years. And in two cases, I was 
fired from my job. Um, and second, I wrote a very uh, extended report about uh, the corruption of the media ownership and self-censorship uh, for Harvard Kennedy School uh, seven years ago, but the report in 12 major parts is, is still valid. I will offer you an expose over uh, the overall situation, uh, which might be somewhat compl complementary to uh, uh, to uh, what Philip Leroux uh, offered, um, because there are so many different aspects of uh, the, the miserable situation now. It's basically a state of emergency uh, where free speech and media freedom uh, finds itself in uh, for, for many years now uh, in Turkey. Um, I am uh, now in exile, like uh, many other colleagues um, in, in Europe and North America and elsewhere. I think the number, um, fairly speaking, is about 200. Um, those colleagues from various um, flanks of, of, of Turkish media, uh, numbering about 200, mainly in, in Western Europe, but elsewhere too. Um, and uh, it was a difficult time after the attempted coup for many of, of my colleagues. Some of us were lucky, some of us was, were, were less lucky. Some had to flee under uh, horrendous circumstances. Some left normally, but uh, the fact remains the same that they are unable to operate freely, independently, safely in, in Turkey now. And I think we see now formation of what one might call an exile media uh, or, or diaspora media, whatever you might want to call it. It's important because you mentioned online journalism and online journalism, and to a certain extent, TV gives us possibilities to address the issues, to report correctly, accurately. Uh, what is missing in Turkey uh, is, is very clear uh, in, that, in those terms. Turkey has become a hell for fake news, lies, and immense propaganda. Uh, and of course, a blackout of what's been happening inside Turkey and outside Turkey for the public in general. Um, and I will offer you this expose with the risk of slightly exceeding my time, but I think the facts and findings are important to note uh, uh, at this moment. During my career, I was both inside journalism, uh, as I mentioned. Um, there are various dimensions of this censorship, self-censorship, corruption, ethical breaches, internal polarization in the sector is also very important. And um, this kind of activity is, should continue uh, to, to um, update these informations. Um, when we look at the conditions of, a journalism, of the journalism in any country, uh, four basic criteria is important. That's the, those are the pillars of what makes journalism uh, consistent, credible, and influential. Uh, freedom, editorial independence, pluralism and diversity, and safety. Um, these are the things that make the fourth power, fourth power. And um, without a solid democratic constitution and independent judiciary, there is absolutely no way uh, in journalism to, to thrive, to operate. And this is what we have seen uh, since the attempted coup. Judiciary is now part of the political executive. It's not protecting, it's not constituting a shield, a legal shield for, for journalism. It is, it has become power in itself. And if you look at Hungary, Poland, Russia, Egypt, Brazil, uh, all of them, countries are, are, are really uh, experiencing the same problems. And um, you know, if Trump had to leave White House, despite attempts to take over power fully, you know, uh, judiciary and the media um, worked together in a way from their points of view uh, and uh, protected democracy. Since about, of course, the things went in opposition, oppos opposite direction in, in Turkey, uh, far worse. Uh, and it's a very, very um, scary case study, globally speaking. Um, since 2014, uh, more or less, having lost the judiciary, uh, Turkish media became more and more and more vulnerable, individually, journalists, but also institutions. Um, since 2013, 
we have been watching an endless downward sp spiral of our profession. Uh, as many of you, uh, you know, about uh, the, the listeners know, uh, events known as Gezi Park protests was the major breaking point uh, in speeding up the destruction of our job. In June 2013, when the protests spread to 80 out of 81 pro provinces, many journalists were fired. And uh, soon after, um, next year, following year, 2014, Freedom House, for the first time, downgraded Turkey from partly free to not free. Uh, and this caused a lot of fury uh, in, in, in the government, but it was very clear that Erdogan keeping very busy uh, trying to take full control over the TV channels, and I will explain why, uh, uh, had basically uh, uh, suffocated the, the mainstream media. Uh, and uh, this then went all the way down. So after seven years of nightmare, uh, we are now at the rock bottom in the media sector. More than 95% of the media sector in direct or indirect control of the government. And the tiny 5%, maybe less, maybe less, is in a very bad shape, losing ground every day. Uh, Turkey remains for the seven consecutive years as not free in Freedom House rankings. And Reporters Without Borders places Turkey, placed Turkey this time as 154th out of 180 countries. Um, and also, uh, I will mention European Court of Human Rights figures lately. Um, um, Turkey ranks first among 47 Council of Europe member states uh, and the number of judgments uh, concerning violations of freedom of expression in 2020, many of them media, of course. 97 cases uh, involving Turkey in 2020 and 85 were found to involve at least one rights violation. And uh, most common violations uh, were freedom of expression, followed by right to a fair trial and right to liberty and security. Um, 97 rulings, I said, Turkey violated at least one article uh, in the European Convention of Human Rights, and it was followed by Russia, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but this tells you how severely intolerant the regime in Ankara is about the free speech or, or dissenting opinion. Um, please note also that this is not only a political or legal problem. Uh, the intolerance to freedom of expression in Turkey has for ages been a social and cultural phenomenon as well. The intolerance to dissent, objection, or civilized uh, standing up uh, attitudes meet often equally severe reaction from silencing across the society, even from the opposing opposition circles. So um, the public discourse has always been somewhat damaged by this. Uh, this should be mentioned as well as a part of the cultural uh, heritage, let's say. Uh, but back to institutionalized oppression and some facts. Those are assembled recently, these facts. How many journalists are in prison? Figures vary depending on the criteria. Reporters Without Borders say 13 at the moment. Uh, this is, to my view, far too low. According to Platform for Independent Journalism, P24, uh, of which I am a founding member in 2014, uh, those numbers are 83 uh, as of uh, 2000 and January 2021. According to Stockholm Center for Freedom, uh, it's far higher. Uh, 175 journalists are behind bars and uh, 167 are wanted or either in exile or at large. Um, a total of 48 journalists spent at least one day in police custody last year. The reasons for their arrests, including uh, are including referring to the fate of uh, Syrian refugees, investigating the government's handling of COVID-19 pandemic, corruption, and covering the Kurdish issue. And courts are very generous in, in handing out prison sentences. Record holders are two journalists. Uh, one of them, you know, the other less known, 
The highest number of the years of imprisonment was given last year to Mehmet Baransu, a reporter who covered the military and its coup files and national security issues. It's a very dangerous assignment for a daily taraf, a newspaper that's shut down now. Baransu was a, uh, he was sentenced to 19 years, 19 and a half years of imprisonment first, and then another 17 years and one month, which means he is now sentenced to a total of nearly 37 years of imprisonment. Then we have John Dundar, the former editor of daily newspaper, Jumuriet. He was recently sentenced to 27 and a half years in prison in uh, December, uh, about Christmas time in 2020, on charges of spying and assisting to a, assisting a terrorist organization. He was sentenced in absentia, uh, and also uh, he was his, his assets, his family's assets were seized thereafter. Uh, so another figure that should be mentioned is Turkey's oldest imprisoned journalist, Ahmed Altan, who is still being held in Silivri prison, uh, although uh, the life sentences that he, uh, his brother Mehmet Altan, another journalist, Nazlı Ilıcak, received in 2018, were overturned by Supreme Court. And uh, also European Court, for some bizarre reason, still holding uh, Ahmed Altan case, uh, not reacting to it. So, uh, and other issues are, 63 journalists were convicted of insulting the president. Um, uh, since uh, 2014. And uh, then we have uh, 139 Turkish journalists who were uh, targeted by physical violence, direct physical violence. I said not only individual journalists, but institutions, outlets were also targeted. Um, at least 160 media outlets have been forced to close since the attempted coup, more or less. And uh, many of them uh, are uh, affiliated with the pro Gulen movement media, but also uh, many others are, are affiliated with, uh, with the Kurdish issues, what you can call pro-Kurdish media, and also uh, some parts of the Alevi flanks of the media or, or secular flanks of the media were also uh, affected. A total of 3,436 journalists have been fired from Turkish media. Uh, since in the past five years. Only last year, 215 were uh, left without a job. One important aspect that will tell you how about this state of independence in journalism is about job security. The rate of journalists who are members of trade unions is only about eight to 10% in Turkey, which means for the rest, there is absolutely no job security uh, at all. Um, so, um, the, uh, in summary, the freedom part of the media is breached uh, severely by the following punitive steps, steps. By filing lawsuits based on insulting the president, his family and ministers, based on uh, anti-terror law and criminal code on terror propaganda, revealing state secrets, etc., uh, by arresting journalists for what they try to cover by their reports or social media messages. Radio is not significant in Turkey as a, as a venue, but TV is, and it tops the league of the popular media venue. This is very important. This is the reason why uh, Erdogan and his government attacked TV news channels in 2013. Why? Because the, the facts don't change. According to UNESCO, Turkish audience, Turkish public overall, get their news and commentary for free from TV channels up to nearly 89%. This is more or less the same fact in Russia. So the one who controls the TV media in Turkey controls more or less the entire media sector and output. So um, that's why uh, whatever happens in TV, it gets the attention of, of the government. Uh, that is proven fact after fact. So um, some few words, a few words about, uh, about the uh, online media and I will stop there. Um, this is 
Um, also, I would mention a few words about newspapers. People more don't read newspapers anymore in Turkey because of economic crisis, but also it's, it's declining. Total circulation is less than half of what it was two, three years ago. And uh, the tiny opposition, what they call themselves newspapers, what I call critical media or partisan media, um, their circulation numbers do not exceed uh, nine, 10,000, with one exception, Sözcü, which is an opinion paper, that sells about 200,000, but it has less news than opinion. So um, it's important to mention how the control mechanism is, is happening right now in today's Turkey. One major step was taken by, uh, by the government to establish a directorate for communications which directly reports to the palace, has no accountability or checks and balances responsibility whatsoever to parliament. And it is run and directly without any uh, transparency uh, to, to the government, to, to, to the president, actually. It's a presidential uh, directorate. It employs thousands of people. It controls the media entirely and gives directions and warnings, uh, and also uh, at many in many cases uh, executes certain punitive measures such as um, causing dismissals or censorship. Uh, Radio Television Supreme Board, which is then in the domination of, of the of the opposition party, uh, the, the power parties, excuse me, AKP and MHP, in its members, operates now as another censorship board. Uh, which it can issue, uh, it can issue uh, licenses in cases that uh, the venue is, is pro-government. It can stop issuing licenses. Also, it issues lots of fines and measures to, uh, to block uh, TV channels. Um, and um, uh, finally, um, about the online, because online is, is something that can still people breathe in terms of free speech to a certain extent. Um, according to Yaman Akten, is a founding member of Association of Freedom of Expression. The past seven years, until October 2020, um, 140,000 URL addresses, 42,000 tweets, and 11,000 YouTube videos were banned access to in Turkey. Again, these bannings, uh, happen without any uh, proper due legal process. It, it's uh, done by another institution called BT, BTK, uh, which can arbitrarily impose those, those sections. Um, Free, Web, Free Web Turkey, another site of another monitoring site, found out that 42% of all banned news stories between November 10 to October 20 last year were about Erdogan and his family, such as his wife buying Vuitton bag in terms of uh, French goods boycotting, uh, etc. Uh, those were the, the, the main majority. 56 URL sites were banned because of their critical news content on COVID pandemic. And, uh, and I'm going to finish in, in, in a couple of sentences. Until last Ju July, the main censorship measure was banning access to URL addresses, YouTube videos, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, for example, our Ahval was banned three times because of our corruption stories. Um, then apart from that, Jin, Jin News, which is a Kurdish site, was banned 27 times last year. Oda TV, a sort of secular website, um, four times. Independent Turkish version, four times etc cetera, etc cetera. access bans are important they are imposed often generously by peace courts and the appeals process is totally cyclic for example one peace court issues a ban you object to it and they, it's the second peace court that uh, decides about uh, what uh, to do and those are directly appointed by the by the government those judges so it's a ridiculous uh, vicious circle uh, which is happening there. Um, now, uh, one major issue, which is going to add salt, more salt to the wound, 
is the obligation uh, pre being prepared uh, to be imposed on social media giants. It's underway. Uh, they are were forced to open offices and appointing representatives in Turkey. Most of them, except Twitter, accepted that. Twitter is resisting and it's becoming more and more targeted because it started now to impose restrictions on government officials or ministers. For example, the, the Bahçeli tweets were now uh, being restricted because what Twitter saw was inciting to violence, as well as uh, uh, Minister of Interior Süleyman Soylu's tweets were, were also restricted because he was attacking uh, LGBT community in Turkey, targeting them. And this is, of course, adding uh, a lot of, uh, causing a lot of anger uh, amongst the uh, government officials. So overall, uh, in a nutshell, uh, we are faced with a horrible situation where uh, we find our domain nar narrower and narrower to reach the audience. It's an ongoing battle, but uh, uh, it's a very steep uphill battle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there was perhaps because there was mentioned uh, Ahmed Altan by coincidence, we have his book here of Ahmed Altan. I want to pay tribute to him. It's a very interesting book, also very well written book about uh, with the title in Belgium is I will never see the world again. And it is a very good example of how people uh, in an arbitrary way are kept in prison because of their ideas and what they are saying. And his special situation was that he at the same time was condemned for communistic uh, agitation and Greenistic agitation, which is quite remarkable to have both in one side. Uh, there are some questions. There is a question uh, that has been asked uh, to, uh, to Professor Baskin. Uh, those who help the victims financially and are giving uh, psychological support are also targeted, uh, the question says. What do you think about uh, this, uh, Professor Baskin? Can you ask it? So it's about the victims who, who, who are helping, people who are helping financially, psychologically, the victims uh, are also uh, prosecuted, also uh, targeted. Uh, can you give some comment on that? That was a question that has been raised. Tekrar Türkçe konuşacağım. Türkiye'dekilere hitap edebilmek için genel olarak. Türkiye'de konuşabilirsiniz ve yazabilirsiniz. Eğer hapse atılma riskini göze alabiliyorsanız. Dediğim gibi konuşmak yazmak serbest. Eğer içeri atılma riskini göze alıyorsanız. Sanıyorum bu cevap. Tabii ki biz bu e, kanunla, hukukla ilgisi olmayan yöntemlerle Taciz edilen insanlara kar karşı çıkıyoruz. Ama bazı şeyleri göz alır. Almada devam edeceğiz. Other questions here. Um, a question to Mr. Root, uh, who said, do you think EU leaders can meet on common grounds to start a discussion on Turkey's EU membership status? I suppose that this question comes from the fact that we saw, and it's mentioned in the report also, that at the moment, discussions about EU membership are going on. The human rights violations seem to be a bit less important than it was before and now, where these discussions are not really active. Uh, Philip, can you react on that, please? Yeah, the, the relationship between the European Union in Turkey is very complicated indeed. Some months ago, you had the, the insults from uh, President Erdogan to, to the French President Macron, and suddenly uh, Turkey changed its tone. Uh, the question uh, of Turkey becoming a, a member of uh, European Union, I think, I, I, I don't believe in it. And I, I'm not sure Turkish uh, people still think it, it will be possible or reach, reachable. And uh, unfortunately, I, 
I noticed that those questions of uh, human rights, press freedom, freedom of expression are not at the, at the top of the list in, in discussion. Uh, if they can find agreement on Azerbaijan, on, on Libya, on, on, on, on uh, gas exploration in, in, in the sea, that's the, the main topics. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the repeated condemnation of Turkey by the European Court of Human Rights don't uh, draw so much attention by the European leaders. The detail is a question that is always very active. Do the European Union has to say Turkey first has to change or do they have to continue to talk? The only way to change is to talk, of course, but uh, we must admit that for the moment it is a very difficult one. I have another question here. President Erdogan is talking about new constitution and a broad-based consensus to write it. Uh, what do we think? Well, uh, there is a Latin proverb that says, Tineo, Timeo Danaios et Dona Ferentes. That's Latin to say, I am afraid of the Danaish people, even if they bring gifts. And that's one to say, uh, you should not trust someone when he is for 10, 20 years oppressing everyone to say, we will work together. So uh, let's say that as long as we do not see that this effort to make a new constitution that is talking about a series, uh, we should not uh, keep it too much in mind. The first act to do when you want a constitution to be made in consensus is to free the opponents, not keep people imprisoned for their thoughts and not torturing people who are, have another idea. So I think that is our, uh, our small um, um, answer. That is also about, uh, do we have selective race of, about journalists? I think we should not be selective. There's two, two people who mentioned, Hadayat Karacha and Ari Unal. I think journalists have to be free and should express their opinions within, of course, the way that journalism is, has to be uh, executed in a regular way, then it has to be complete freedom. Um, we have our last uh, speaker of today. Our last speaker uh, of today is uh, Celcuk Kultashli, sorry, Turkish name are really difficult for a Belgian uh, professor. Um, he has, uh, he's a journalist. He has been working in Belgium also. Uh, in as, as the chief of, uh, of the office in Brussels. And of course, as unfortunately so many journalists, uh, he has a very clear experience what freedom of opinion is not. And so I welcome you, uh, Chelchuk, and I give you voluntarily the floor. Thank you for participating anyhow. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, my name is Chelchuk Kutashlo. I was Zaman's Brussels bureau chief until the newspaper was brutally confiscated by the Erdogan regime in March 2016. Mm -hmm. There is an arrest warrant on me for being a member of an armed terrorist group. After the failed coup attempt in July 2016, the state of the media freedom in Turkey has gone from bad to worse. According to Freedom House, Turkey's global freedom status is not free. It has only a score of 32 over 100. Its score in political rights and civil liberties is both 16 over 100. In terms of internet freedom, Freedom House ranks Turkey as not free. It scores only 35 over 100. Reporters Without Borders has ranked Turkey 154 out of 180 countries in this press freedom index of 2020. Press freedom in Turkey is worse than Zimbabwe, Uganda, Tanzania, and Afghanistan, among others. The European Commission published its last progress report on Turkey in October. The progress report said there are currently 120 journalists in prison, which makes Turkey the champion of journalist jailer. According to the report, Turkish vice president stated that the press cards of almost 4,000 journalists have been canceled since 2015. Only in 2019, 715 cards were canceled. Again, according to the report, regarding the internet and the implementation of the internet law, Turkish authorities asked for the removal of almost 9,000 
specific accounts in the first half of 2019. As of end of July 2020, access to 408,000, I repeat, 408,000 websites is blocked in Turkey. Only 21,000 of these websites that are blocked are on the order of criminal peace judges, public prosecutor's offices, or by a court decision. The rest were blocked by other state institutions. In other words, websites could be banned arbitrarily without an established set of rules. In some cities, human rights defenders and associations were forced to sign a document by the authorities indicating that they would avoid certain words and expressions such as war, trustee, right to election, and elect in their presence. The Stockholm Center for Freedom, founded by exiled Turkish journalists, has a regularly updated list of jailed reporters. According to SCF, the number of jailed journalists is 175. Number of wanted journalists is 167. 94 journalists are arrested, 81 is convicted. Most of those convicted are from the Gulen movement, which Erdogan accuses of staging the coup and its accusation the Gulen movement has denied. The second largest group of the jihad journalists is our Kurdish colleagues. The, the feud between Zaman and the government started with the largest corruption case in Republican history in December 2013. While Zaman insisted on deepening of the investigations, the then Prime Minister Erdogan called the investigations a coup attempt on his democratically elected government. In the investigation, four ministers, together with Erdogan's family members, were implicated. In the wake of December 17 corruption case, Erdogan changed many laws to be able to cover up the corruption. Many EU-inspired or EU-sanctioned laws were scrapped taking back Turkey to the 1990s. On March the 4th, 2016, the government violently seized Turkey's, Turkey's largest circulating newspaper, Zaman. The editor-in-chief was forced out by the police together with, together with many editors. The courts appointed so-called trustees to Zaman. Critical editorial line of Zaman changed overnight. Uh, it has become a very pro Erdogan newspaper the other day Erdogan being at the headlines, uh, laughing and boasting himself, boasting himself of uh, great achievements. I myself, <clears throat> excuse me, I myself received an email on April the 5th informing that I was sacked on Turkish labor law, Article 25, Paragraph 2. As I have never heard about this article, I got curious and Googled it. The article was giving the employer the right to sack its employees without any rights whatsoever when the employee was committing indecent, immoral behavior, including sexual assault at the workplace. Most of my colleagues have been fired based on this article to effectively prevent them to use their social and economic rights. I myself called the newspaper and wanted to talk to trustees. Despite being promised, no one called back. I emailed the trustees inviting them to provide me the evidence that I had committed indecent behavior in the workplace. There was no answer. I hired a lawyer to sue the trustees who sacked me without any shred of evidence. My lawyer has been arrested in 2017. I tried to hire other lawyers, but they were so intimidated, I couldn't find anyone to pick, my file, to pick up my file. On July 15, 2016, an attempt by the military to overthrow the government failed. After the failed coup attempt, Zaman was banned. Right after the coup, 189 media, media outlets have been either shut down or seized. More than 30% of the journalists lost their jobs. At the end of August, there was a second list of journalists to be detained. And I was on that list together with my colleagues. I am being accused of membership in a terrorist organization. So I cannot go to Turkey for the last six years. On December 2000, in December 2016, the court decided this time to confiscate 
the properties of 54 people, most of them journalists from Zaman Daily. On the 1st of April, the judge of the case against many Zaman journalists decided to release them pending trial. However, after the verdict, a huge campaign started in the social media against the release, of course, by AKP supporters, some of them so-called journalists asking the judge to keep locking up their colleagues. The judge was personally threatened by one of the AKP columnists that he would himself be jailed. In the evening, the judge had to reverse his verdict and decided to keep my colleagues behind the bar. Nevertheless, he was dismissed from the case. I mean, he was banished. Same thing happened in Antalya. Zaman reporters who were imprisoned after the failed coup were freed and then re-arrested. The judge was also dismissed from the case. The message is clear. No judge can release journalists without prayer authorization from the government. Those who dare to do so will be punished. The indictment that I was eagerly looking forward to read about the columnists of Zaman was accepted in 2017. The prosecutor was asking three aggravated life sentences for each and every defendant, defendant for attempting coup d'etat and also asking 15 years imprisonment for each being, for being members of an armed terrorist organization. I carefully read the 64 pages indictment. First of all, there is not one single weapon found related to defendants. There is not one single evidence connecting them to the failed coup, no communication whatsoever with the coup perpetrators or the military personnel. What the prosecutor has is the articles written by these columnists. Take the example of Shahin Alpai. He is being accused of participating in perception engineering. It's a new phrase invented by the prosecutor. Uh, his article of February 8, 2014 has the title of both crime and punishment are personal. This article is seen as evidence of perception engineering. There is a particular sentence at the indictment which deserves special attention. The prosecutor says, even in their articles, which seem to have no criminal activity, they have violated the rights of statesmen and government authorities. So the prosecutor himself actually confessing, admitting that there is no criminal activity. Let me quote another incredible paragraph from, the, from page 51 of the indictment. I quote, in the media and web pages of the organization, a commercial had been aired on October the 5th for Zaman Daily after an aerial image of a city center where we hear sirens a baby is smiling on the screens. We assess that this commercial was actually heralding the looming coup d'etat. Right after nine months and 10 days of the start of the commercial of the sirens, the coup took place. This cannot be explained by mere coincidence. So a commercial that's aired almost 10 months ago was referred to as an evidence that Zaman knew the exact timing of the coup. On the same page, prosecutors this time referred to the commercial of Axiom Weekly, which was also affiliated with the Grand Movement. Analyzing the commercial, prosecutor discovered another baby who cries along with the firing weapons. When the weapons fell silent, the baby starts smiling. Prosecutor believes the commercial, this commercial was also the message of the coup. However, the weekly was published in January 2014. Another media group was also targeted for its affiliation with the Gulen movement. IPEC Media Group was owned by a businessman called Akin IPEC, and he was critical of the Erdogan regime. The group had two newspapers, two, news, two TV channels. In October 2015, even before the coup d'etat, the government confiscated the media group. And after the coup, the companies of Akunipek were confiscated. The company's value was estimated to be around 10 billion US dollar. As I stressed at the beginning, Turkey is an accident 
candidate, acceding candidate country to the European Union since 2005. Since I am in Brussels and have covered Brussels for so many years, I want to say a few words about the European Union. The EU decision of December 2004, which started accession talks with Turkey, clearly states that if there is a consistent breach of rule of law, the talks will be suspended. I quote that paragraph. In the case of a serious and persistent breach in a candidate state of the principles of liberty, democracy, respect for human rights, and fundamental freedoms, and the rule of law on which the union is founded, the commission will, on its own initiative or on the request of one third of the member states, recommend the suspension of negotiations and propose the conditions for eventual resumption. End of the quote. Despite this clear wording of the paragraph, EU has pursued a policy of appeasement vis-a-vis -vis the Erdogan regime. The last commission report I just referred to has determined that Turkey does not fulfill the Copenhagen criteria anymore. The agreement of 2016 on refugees, maybe we should say the dirty deal between Turkey and the EU, has been very successfully instrumentalized by the Turkish government. Erdogan has very successfully bought the silence of European Union in return for stopping refugees. Under the watchful eyes of EU, Erdogan changed the constitution by a controversial referendum for a one-man rule. So we have a new constitution with no checks and balances right now. So the last sentence I wanna say is, despite the backsliding on almost each and every EU criteria, Brussels pretends Turkey is still a candidate country, which I found the position of European Union, which I found shameful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I have some questions. Uh, Yavuz, there is a question here that uh, someone is asking. Um, remote Clay, uh, that's his name. He says, how safe it is for journalists in exile to write their stories. Abdullah Boskurt was molested in Sweden, for example, by three men. Are you and your colleagues in exile also threatened by phone calls, mail, social media, etc.? Can you answer that, uh, Yavuz? Um, yes, uh, this has become a worrisome uh, pattern now. Uh, not only journalists, but some academicians and uh, politicians as well in Europe uh, were uh, experienced some targeting, um, especially in Germany and Scandinavia. Um, we, we, we are aware of this. Uh, there has not been any tangible uh, picture of threat uh, that we face, but um, uh, we followed or we do follow the cases in, in Berlin, especially, uh, where some of our colleagues go with bodyguards, uh, where the density of, of, of people from Turkey are uh, many major German cities uh, there are uh, people with from with the origin from Turkey, and most of, many of them are supporters, staunch supporters of of the government. And there have been um, one assassination attempts in in, in Austria uh, to the Green uh, MP candidate Beri Van Aslan, one open uh, telephone threat to uh, social scientist Burak Chopur in in, in Essen. And uh, also a physical attack, as you mentioned, uh, in, in Stockholm. I think each and every um, uh, country should be aware that the, uh, these patterns are, as long as the, the government continues on this path, will, will continue to be uh, uh, um, powerful reminders of, of uh, what we face. So uh, everyone uh, uh, should be aware of, of this fact. Um, uh, it's not e an easy job to, to continue to do this, um, uh, to this um, in, in the, even, even, even in free domains, I would say. And Thank another you. question, I think there is another question that I saw, I can see the questions by Ivo yes. Fitzherbert. To you, it is in Turkish, I cannot read it. No, no, there is one in, uh, there's one in English. 
Yes. Uh, I think it's Ivo Fitzherbert. Uh, says, yes. You mentioned access bans. It's we are talking about online media, and as part of the new social media law, an additional law was added alongside the normal access ban. Rather than blocking access by blocking URLs of specific content, this law forces news publishers to remove the content from their websites. Yes, this is a very uh, it's quite new, uh, and uh, it is monitored by Engelli Web uh, site. And we see every day people um, uh, reporting, uh, especially people in powerful positions, the government officials, bureaucrats, or directly MPs of AKP or MHP, or uh, business personalities affiliated with the power circles. They are keeping very, very busy to remove this this content uh, one year before two years before so it is like cleansing a public memory uh, which is happening uh, i think in a more wide scale sense than any other country that i know of so this should be put into attention i will also remind in this context that uh, uh, my colleague uh, i don't think he mentioned it but uh, the most one of the most tragic aspects of memory deletes has happened already with many of the institutions, outlets, whose websites were closed down, uh, for example, the Daily Taraf, but many other examples that are there, and their total digital archives were deleted. In the case of, for example, today's Zaman, which was a very influential uh, newspaper uh, in English, uh, its archives are gone. It was used by academia, by think tanks, uh, many people wrote uh, op-ed articles or, or, or findings, uh, and they are gone. All these links, references are gone, evaporated. And this, I think, is uh, an unprecedented uh, barbarism that we have faced uh, in terms of deleting the memory. And now this uh, uh, removal of, of the contents is a new phase, uh, which will leave the public memory uh, null and void. Um, we have here a statement, it's not a real question, and I will give it in English because I cannot read the Turkish version. It's someone, I, I will read the testi testimony. It has nothing to do with freedom of press, but I want to do it. I'm an officer posted in Romania. I was taken into custody and charges of manslaughter, wounding and attempting to do the coup d'etat. Following such slander, I received a dishonorable discharge. I was never involved in anything, but they put my name on the international water terrorist list and put a cash price on my head, only because I saw that Turkish and world public opinion were deceived and because I exposed them and struggled against them. They organized the lynching against me through use of various fake news on the media. Uh, and I now see, he continues, the press is being suppressed to hide the events, to hide torture, to hide rape, enforce disappearance, corruption, and to silence and intimidate society. And finally, to destroy uh, the country, uh, which is uh, in the same sense as, uh, as already has been said, uh, said here. Um, I still have here uh, a question um, from Celik, who says there are a lot of undemocratic practices and everything depends on equality. Why the European Union and the United Nations don't decide on economic sanctions or travel restrictions on people who involved undemocratic practices to change the actual situation? After the declaration of the American government, Turkey stepped back and released Pastor Brunson. Um, we talked about that in the former uh, webinar there is a movement, uh, what they call the Magnitsky Act movement, which is trying to put indeed, not only on the country sanctions, but also um, <clears throat> on the persons who are responsible, sanctions personally on travel bans and on economic uh, sanctions. We must admit, however, that how the European Union in words often is declaring their support for human rights and for freedom and democracy, but still sees basically uh, Turkey as an ally, as a partner to talk with, 
and uh, about talking about freedom, but the acts uh, basically are really not very convincing. I think we need to say that, that how it is. Uh, there is some hypocrisy, I think, uh, that uh, unfortunately it's for American companies, it, it's American government, uh, European governments, they are in a bit schizophrenic situation, what Chelchuk said. And the, the people who really are a good intention are hesitating to say we stop anyhow negotiation or we will continue because it's the only way to push them still. And it is a bit of an impossible a catch-22 situation. Last question. <clears throat> Do the panelists think the critical opposition media in Turkey, as well as those in exile, manage to challenge the core narrative of the government? It seems some criticism evade what matters most, such as the official narrative for coup attempt. So do we stay? I remember that Yavu said 95% of the press is actually closed down or has no power to go against. Does the critical media still has an impact? That's a question I will start with Yavuz and then with Chelchuk and then with Professor Baskin to stop. First, Yavuz. Um, I would say, realistically speaking, it has limited influence. I think uh, in the uh, in the in Turkish domain, at least, to reach because uh, online uh, internet access nationwide in Turkey is somewhere between fifty-five to sixty percent, and um, it is concentrated on urban areas, mainly west, Western Anatolia, uh, Istanbul, Izmir. Antalya, etc., etc., and Ankara, uh, and uh, this is a very select audience. First of all, uh, the conservative segments of the society or rural segments of the society use internet less, especially the voters of of AKP, ruling AKP, uh, and they have uh, been, um, I would say, um, haunted by uh, by by the TV controlled by the government. So uh, the official uh, narrative will continue to dominate, but what a, the um, critical media or alternative media does is basically to correct what's wrong, uh, try to offer uh, the truth for those who are interested in it. And there is also, um, I think, more and more um, usage of, of uh, YouTube or podcasts that are uh, also reaching uh, the younger uh, audiences. Um, it's important to note that if there will be an election uh, in the near future, uh, which is very uh, dubious in terms of fairness uh, to be held uh, in, in such uh, elections, uh, about uh, 20 million uh, of the voters in 2022-23 will be those below 30 years of age. And about 10 million of them, half of them, are still undecided. I think it is important to notice that these youngsters, young voters, first time or second time voters, are more tied to internet and online. Sociologically speaking, there are more possibilities there for online journalism to reach these audiences. So um, I think uh, it's important to keep the flag high. It is also uh, important to be aware that uh, media control uh, will continue. It's also important to notice that polarization inside the journalism sector is continuing. Unfortunately, still there are hostilities and enmities and undue suspicions at this stage between different flanks of the Turkish journalism. Uh, and these will be a counter uh, uh, operative to what journalism should do in Turkey. Uh, I think it's equally important that uh, journalists from different flanks of, of Turkish media try to overcome these differences because there is only one battle that is valid for all of us, freedom of the media, independence of the media, diversity, plurality of the media, and a powerful, free public discourse. This is what we should fight for and nothing else. Uh, and uh, I think we have, as I said in my presentation, a very steep uphill battle to handle. Uh, but I put a lot of hope into, into what we are doing in online media. 
us, for example, Ahval News Online, just to give an example, to conclude, we have about uh, daily, uh, about 200, 250,000 unique visitors per day. We have about 12 million page views per month. Uh, we have an enormous following in podcasts, which is a challenge to government imposed censorship and also uh, YouTube videos, which are also uh, powerful, influential in terms of challenging the censorship efforts. So each and every one of us are competitors as well in alternative media. We do our bits and we will continue to our bits. It's only the job, the, the profession that matters, at least for us at Ahwal. We don't pay any attention to uh, what to serve, etc. Uh, I think independence is very important. Okay, I think that was a clear answer that counts a bit for everyone. We still have a question about the European uh, Court of Human Rights and what do you think about the visit of the European Court to Erdogan and the court's verdicts in favor of the regime? I think we must state that in the beginning after the coup, that the European Court was very cautious and prudent and tried to avoid to condemn uh, the regime, uh, supporting the regime after the coup, you could find it in, in the court, I find, I think. And I think they made a mistake by that, by being too, too uh, how to say, too nice towards uh, what happens. However, I also must admit, and we have to see that lately, uh, the last year, the European court is more finally uh, becoming more uh, more critical, more critical, and I think that's an important sign. Uh, anyhow, Turkish government is not executing the decisions yet, but we must see that in the Kavala case, for instance, outcome case, other cases, you see a bit of difference where also for the first time, the European court is, uh, is uh, hesitating to say that the judiciary in Turkey is too independent which is quite an important step for them. We can easily say it, but the, the, the, the court now for the first time went in that direction. What I learned from all the contributions, I will very shortly say, Philip gave us a key ransom to Turkey, uh, respect international standards uh, that are necessary in a democratic society. The answer clearly no, there is no doubt about and it is not because it is a reaction of the coup. It is a kind of systematic approach, systematic uh, tentative to shut down everyone who is critical and who has critical views. And Professor Baskin uh, was very clear in saying, be careful, it's not only about freedom of expression, but it's even freedom of thought, what you think, the uh, judges, and the government can even uh, judge about your thinking. How do you think freedom of thought, which is even by far much uh, more severe. The digital control was mentioned. I think it was Judge who also said more than 400,000 websites who were blocked. That's amazing number, of course. And yeah, who clearly said the younger generation is working with this digital. So it is crucial to have that. But I think to add that, and, and in a lot of reports we do not talk so easily, you can have the freedom to say something, the freedom of expression, but structurally the pluralism in the press, the fact you have different streamings, you have different owners, you have different outlets with different few is also important. If everyone is free to say what he wants, but only one group in the ultimate phase has ownership of the press, then this freedom, of course, has no content. And it's important that we not only think about the freedom, but also about the structural pluralism of the, of the press. Uh, Yavu said 95% of the press is not free anymore, doesn't exist anymore, or is under control and has not the right to say what they want. And we see in the media targeting outside Turkey uh, that you have to be aware of, uh, and that's for sure. If we come closer to elections and so on, uh, the tension will be uh, even more important. I would like uh, to, to, to round up this, this webinar 
we were about a good more than four five hundred people who have followed this webinar, which is an amazing high number. And I'm glad we could do that. Um, the next webinar will be on March 10th, exactly on the access to justice, to justice and the independent dependency of the, the judiciary to also important themes because uh, every violation, if it now is freedom of the press or another one that is not uh, targeted by the judiciary will continue. Violations will continue if there are no judicial uh, sanctions. The tribunal itself will be held from three to seven uh, May, normally in Geneva, if uh, at that time uh, the COVID uh, pandemic would not allow us, we will do it finally on a digital way. We would like to do it physically. We think in May it will be possible, but anyhow, we will not let this pandemic silence uh, us forever. There are limits to our patience and limits to our silence, and we have to speak up. We will do it physically. If we cannot, we will do it digitally in the beginning of May. I would like to thank everyone, the interpreters, uh, both of them who are helping us, International Observatory for Human Rights, for organizing, the speakers, the participants, all the people who are attending us, and we hope to see you back on the 10th of March. Thank you very much, and see you soon. Thank you.